right on time. Ani, you want to take it away? Sounds good. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 49th virtual shadowing session. Uh, today's topic is going to be over GI and endoscopy and our wonderful guest for tonight, uh, Dr. Dilatur. She'll introduce herself shortly. Next slide. All right, and this is our virtual shouting team. We have Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno, uh, and the rest of the working group. Next slide, please. And some upcoming sessions. So next week, we're gonna have a PA spotlight on, oh, never mind. Uh, that was last week's. Uh, next week, we're gonna have a family medicine doctor, Dr. Morales, join us. And the week after that, we're going to have a hospitalist, Dr. Siri, join us. And as always, all our sessions are going to be live on Zoom or they're going to be recorded and posted on YouTube live. Next slide, please. All right. And then uh, before I hand it off to Dr. Latour, I want to hand it off to uh, Dr. Fowler real quick for announcement. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you're here. This is virtual shadowing. We started this almost a year ago for you, and, uh, and in so doing, we've now reached 28 nations and over 1,000 universities. Uh, we've had over 220,000 viewings of this program. And so we think we've hit on something that's important for you, the pre-health student, whether it's um, whatever preclinician it is, pre-PA, pre-nursing practitioner, pre-medicine, uh, or any of the wide spectrum of the healthcare profession. We're here for you and we want to be here for you. We're looking at trying to decide what we're gonna do beyond June because around the 1st of June, we'll, we'll have been here for a year. And we'd like to hear from you. Why don't you email us or let us know certainly in chat if you want us to keep going. There will be over 50 lectures available to you online. But if you would like for us to continue to bring to you every week live material from spanning the spectrum of medical care across the medical universe, we'll be here for you. <laughs> I'm seeing chat, all these folks popping up saying, love it and please continue. But we'd like to hear from you because we wanna know that this is something that is helpful. I'm on the admissions committee for the medical school here at UT Southwestern. And I'm gonna be looking to see this year how the virtual shadowing time is accepted on the admissions committee. I suspect it's going to be very positive and I've filled out a very large number of validations of folks who have taken our programs uh, at a number of universities around the country. And so we do make that service available if you ask us to do that. So uh, just, um, you know, keep, keep us in mind. Let us know what you want us to do. We'll be here if you want us to be here. And uh, I see one that mentioned about law and medicine or human resources. Um, I think maybe even a talk on physicians and mental health would be a very good idea. Um, in any case, so we want to thank you for coming. We, we love having you here. It's a high point of our week. All 300 of you, uh, Robia, who are here now with us. So, Ani, I'm going to turn it back over, you, over to you to introduce our exciting guest for the evening. Well, Ani, you are on mute, my friend. Sorry, I do want to interrupt. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by Dr. Delatour. She's a gastroenterologist and an endoscopist in New York. Um, and I don't want to give away too much, so I'm going to hand it over and let her explain the rest. <laughs> no problem at all. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be joining the virtual shadowing crew uh, for I think it would, you said your 49th lecture. Um, my name is Rabia Delator. I'm a gastroenterologist and advanced endoscopist or therapeutic endoscopist at NYU in New York City. And I'm just really excited to be here today. So without further, further ado, I'll start my presentation. So I wanted to start out just talking a little bit about me, my favorite topic, just 
just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how it started, I am originally from Toronto. That's where I was born. My family moved to Buffalo when I was about seven years old. And then since that time, I've just slowly been traversing the state of New York and haven't really left. But one day, maybe I will. Maybe I'll go to Texas. Who knows where you guys are all from? But um, I went to Cornell for undergrad where I got my bachelor's in science. Um, I majored in biological sciences and developmental sociology there. And then I went to Stony Brook University in Long Island for medical school. And these are just some pictures from my journey. Um, on the top right, you can see Cornell. That's in Ithaca, New York. The left is my medical school graduation with one of my friends. On the right is a white coat ceremony photo I found, which is amazing. Um, the state of New York, where I've spent most of my life. Buffalo Bills, for those of you Bills fans out there, we almost made it to the Super Bowl this past year, but not quite. And then here's a picture of my family. I have, uh, I'm married and I have two lovely children who are the most important people in my life. So I just always have to give them a shout out because they're the reason why I am where I am today. So in terms of training after medical school, I spent three years at NYU for internal medicine residency. I was then selected to join their gastroenterology fellowship, um, which is another three years. And then because I'm a masochist and wanted the training to never end, I did one more year of fellowship in advanced endoscopy also at NYU, which was sort of a non-traditional route because they didn't have an advanced endoscopy fellowship, but I wanted to be trained in it. So I asked them to create a fellowship for me and they were kind enough to do that. And then subsequently I joined the faculty at NYU. So I stayed where I trained, which has its pluses and minuses. Um, so here's a picture from our match day in medical school. Here's my first day of residency and here's my first day of fellowship. Um, so Robbie, for, Robbie, for them to create a fellowship specifically for you means they really, really liked you. That's a very special statement that they, they really wanted you to stay and be, be with them. There, you know, when you find people who are willing to mentor you and just foster your growth, like stick to those people, you seem like an amazing mentor to like the students who are working with you. Um, you know, those people really care about your future and want to help you grow and just succeed and basically, you know, reach your reach for the stars. Those are the people that are going to be your ride or die. You could stick with them forever and they'll just really help help you for as much as they can. I have those people at NYU and that's why I've stayed for so long and will stay for the foreseeable future because the mentorship here is really excellent. So I'm very fortunate in that sense. Okay, so how that's how it went and how it's going. I'm now an assistant professor of medicine at NYU and uh, Last year, I became the director of endoscopy at Bellevue Hospital Center, which is the oldest public hospital in the country and has just an amazing amount of history. So it's an NYU hospital and um, I'm the director of endoscopy there, the youngest ever director of endoscopy. And I won't say I'm the first female because I'm one of one of two. So it's been really, really a huge honor to work there. And uh, I work in academic medicine, which is something we were talking about before we started the lecture. But I really love academic medicine because I get to work with students, with residents, fellows, just training in general and teach, which is something I love to do and something I'm really excited to do today as much as I can. So here's just my, my profile photo for our website at NYU and just some pictures from New York. And then here's the lobby of Bellevue Hospital. So this is an old facade. And then they built a new ambulatory care center in the lobby, which is by a really famous architect named I.M. Pei. And so it's just a really excellent building to see if you're ever in New York, you should just pop in and take a look. It's really, really quite gorgeous. All right, before I start, I just want to take a second to talk about Instagram life versus real life. So I'm sure you guys have gotten a lot of lectures. People are here, uh, you know, we're going to tell you how amazing my life is and downplay a lot of the struggles that I had. But I just wanted to show you that I struggled too. I did not get to where I am. Like it was not a walk in the park. There were moments where I felt like totally overwhelmed where I was losing friends and family was angry with me because I had to sacrifice so much to get to where I am today, just like all of you. And it's not an easy path, but if it was an easy path, everybody would do it, right? So what you're doing is so admirable and so honorable, and you should continue and forge along this path if it's what you want to do, because I promise you, if it's really what you want in your heart, it's absolutely worth it. So here are just some pictures of the struggle. And then here's a picture of me on my 27th birthday. I would have loved to have been with my then fiance and my family, but you know, I was with the nurses in the ICU doing a 27 hour shift. And so they got me a Domino's pizza, which they're flaunting like pretty hard in this photo and a Domino's dessert as well. <laughs> so that's how I spent my birthday. So, you know, it's not an easy path, but it's definitely worth it. 
All right. So I'm a gastroenterologist, as I mentioned, and I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail of why I chose gastroenterology. So some of the things that I love about GI are that it's procedure based and I personally love working with my hands. So it's perfect for me. There is a huge wide variety of pathology, anything from liver disease to small bowel like pathologies to colon cancer to pancreatic cancer. There's just so many different things that you can focus on within the field field of gastroenterology. So if you're, you like it, but you're not sure, I would definitely consider pursuing it. And then you can sub sub specialize within gastroenterology, which is what I did, or be a general gastroenterologist, which is extremely interesting as well. Um, it has a very competitive salary, if that's important to you. I mean, we all go through school and a lot of us have a lot of debt. And so there's no shame in, you know, keeping that in mind. It, I don't think it should be your main driving factor um, in medicine and picking a subspecialty, but it's really important to keep that in mind if you know, you're know you deciding between two and you love both. It may help you to make your decision about what to pursue. Um, the field that I work in is really heavy in problem solving and fixing. That is something that I love to do. Uh, I make jokes to my fellows that I have an engineer's mind. If there's a problem, I want to fix it. I have to say, knowing myself, I'm not someone who would do well in a field with like chronic illnesses that have no treatment, I think personally, I would get really frustrated. And so I knew the field, like, for example, neurology might not be the best for me where you're dealing with people for years and there's no cure for a lot of their diseases like MS or other neurologic conditions. So I knew myself enough to knew, know that I just love problem solving and fixing things and having results. So gastroenterology was really appealing to me in that sense as well. There's varying phenotypes of gastroenterology. Like I mentioned, you can be private practice, you can be academic, you can be a hybrid, you can be part-time, you can be full-time. There's just so many different ways. You can be a hepatologist, a transplant hepatologist, purely endoscopist, purely clinical. There's just so many phenotypes. So again, that's another appealing thing about gastroenterology. And then you can choose between academic and private. There are some subspecialties that are really just, they thrive in private practice um, and some that really thrive in academics. Gastroenterology can thrive in both, which is amazing. And so that was another reason why uh, I chose it. So what exactly do I do? There's an action shot of me scoping in my really um, messy endoscopy room. <laughs> Um, so general gastroenterology, the procedures involve upper endoscopy and interventions, which I'll go into and colonoscopy. So evaluation of the upper GI tract and the lower GI tract. I'm an advanced endoscopist. I did an extra year of training. So I also do a whole barrage of additional procedures, including ERCP, which I'm going to go into depth about cholangioscopy, which is, uh, basically scoping within the bile duct and the pancreatic duct if you need to. I do endoscopic ultrasound. I do interventional EUS. Um, I also do bariatric endoscopy, which I'm going to describe in detail. And that's basically recreating surgical procedures for weight loss, but endoscopically. So incisionless uh, without surgery and just all internally within the upper GI tract. I do luminal stenting specifically for cancers and then also for benign strictures. Let's say post-operative stricture is tightened down. We can stent those as well. I do complex polypectomy, which is taking out very large polyps from the, the entire GI tract, wherever they are. Um, for people that used to have to go undergo surgery, they can now have endoscopic resection of these polyps before they turn into cancer. And I also do small bowel enteroscopy, which is scoping of the small bowel, which is not able to be reached by traditional upper endoscopy and colonoscopy. All right, so just going into depth about these procedures. Upper endoscopy is basically an evaluation of the upper GI tract. You're looking from the mouth up here all the way down to the second portion of the small intestine, which isn't that well characterized in this, but you basically evaluate the esophagus, the stomach, and then the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. So this is a picture of the esophagus. Here's a picture of the stomach, and here's a beautiful picture of the duodenum, which again, is the first part of the small intestine. The small intestine has three portions, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And in upper endoscopy, we pretty much just go to the second portion of the duodenum which has four parts and stop there. And that's our evaluation of the upper GI tract. And the patients are sedated and on left lateral when we scope them as seen in this picture. General gastroenterologists also do colonoscopies, which I do routinely. I do like over a thousand a year. Um, it's a slightly thicker 
again, flexible scope uh, as seen here, just like the upper endoscope, but it's a little bit thicker. You start in the anal canal, which is down here, and you basically can reach the first part of the colon, which is called the cecum. And if you like, you can intubate the small intestine from here, which is called the terminal ileum. And we usually see the opening to the appendix right here. So this is a picture of your colon, which has a few parts. You have your rectum here, your sigmoid colon, then you have your descending colon, your transverse colon, and your ascending colon, and then the cecum. So those are all the portions of the large intestine, and that's what we evaluate during a colonoscopy with this flexible scope that reaches all the way around. And this is a picture of the transverse colon, which is usually notated by its triangular shape. So people remember T for T, triangle, transverse. All right, so since I did an extra year of training, I am fortunate enough to you get to do a bunch of really fun procedures um, in addition to upper endoscopy and colonoscopy and associated interventions. I also do endoscopic ultrasound. So an endoscopic ultrasound is basically like an, an, a regular endoscopy, but the probe has an ultrasound probe on it. So I can see structures outside of the gastric lumen. I can see structures outside of the esophagus, outside of the stomach, outside of the small intestine. I can also do endoscopic ultrasound in the rectum, although you're usually limited to the rectum and sigmoid, not much further in the colon because scope is oblique viewing. It's not a forward viewing scope, so it's a little bit more difficult to navigate. So um, what we can do with this is look outside of the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract and do intervention. So here you can see I'm doing a fine needle aspiration or biopsy of a pancreas tumor. Um, traditionally, before US was a thing, people were getting percutaneous biopsies of these lesions under CT guidance, and that can be extremely painful. So this is painless, and you can basically look with ultrasound outside of the stomach wall at the pancreas and other associated organs and do intervention. So FNA or fine needle aspiration or biopsy is just one of them. Here's a picture of an ultrasound showing uh, the common bile duct here, and you can see a stone within the common bile duct, which is a problem. And that's something that we use EUS occasionally to diagnose if we can't see it on imaging. Um, so that's just another thing that we can do with EUS. And I'll talk about what you do for these big stones in the common bile duct because they must come out. All right, so interventional EUS is something else that I do. It's a pretty cool procedure. Um, in some patients who get pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of their pancreas, which can have a variety of different reasons, whether it's binge drinking alcohol, I'm sure Dr. Fowler has seen a lot of pancreatitis in the ER. Um, you know, it can be from medications, it can be from steroids, it can be from trauma when, or gallstones. When you get pancreatitis or an inflammation of the pancreas, the pancreas loves to sequester fluid around it. And sometimes this fluid or water, or whatever fluid pancreatic juices, it can wall off and create a little uh, fluid collection. Those fluid collections can either be left alone if the patient's asymptomatic or they need to be drained if the patient's having pain or if it's infected or if it's causing basically compression of the gastrointestinal tract. When those need to be drained, historically people used to be stuck through their tummy and have a bag sitting outside of their body, which is really uncomfortable for the patient. But you know, a few years ago, um, a group of gastroenterologists basically developed a procedure where we can put this specialized stent between the stomach wall and the fluid collection to allow it to drain. And this is what it looks like when you do that. You do under endoscopic ultrasound and you can see the pus just draining out into the stomach and then just goes into the stomach and passes in your GI tract. So this is a very cool procedure because it's minimally invasive and it basically provides like instantaneous relief for these patients with these collections with the pus just like draining out. So this patient I took out almost two liters of pus from their huge collection. And then a month later, I'll take the stent out and the hole will close off. If the collection is collapsed, then you basically treated them for their peripancreatic fluid collection or walled off pancreatic necrosis. So that's a very cool procedure that I can do. I consider it to be endoscopic surgery. And it's just really exciting that we are able to do that in this day and age with endoscopy. All right, another thing that we can do with the exact same stent is an EUS guided gallbladder drainage. So the gallbladder is here, it sits next to the liver and it basically is a pocket for bile, which the liver creates. And this is a vestigial organ. And again, you don't need your gallbladder. A lot of people, you know, might have had their gallbladders taken out, but sometimes these gallbladders can cause problems. If a stone gets stuck right here in the cystic duct, which is a duct that enters into the common bile duct, 
um, and causes basically bile stasis and uh, infection, super infection. This can get really sick and need to come out. But some people are too old or too sick to have surgery. And the surgeons will say this patient is not a surgical candidate. Historically speaking, they also had to have a drain coming out of their belly. It's called a cholecystostomy tube. And that can be, again, really uncomfortable for these patients when they're like sick and elderly and they're not surgical candidates. Just another thing to have is like this bag outside of their belly. It sucks for the patient. So something that we can do is actually create again, that stent communication between the small intestine, which is right next to the gallbladder and create a drainage outlet for it because any pocket of pus or infection in your body needs to be drained, right? You can't just sit there and fester or you'll get really sick and septic. So you need to have a drainage outlet for any abscess in your body that's large enough to be drained. The gallbladder is no exception. So you either have it taken out with surgery, or if you're not a surgical candidate, this is a procedure that we can do using ultrasound to pierce the gallbladder next to the small intestine and drop the stent in, which again, is an amazing way to basically spare the patient from having a bag outside of them. So again, here's my scope with the ultrasound probe right here. And here's our needle that we use to pierce the um, gallbladder in this picture. And then we basically remove our needle. We have like a catheter that the stent basically is deployed over. So it's a really cool procedure again, that we can do with interventional uh, endoscopic ultrasound, which is pretty awesome. Now I want to focus on this slide for a little while because for me, Hey, Rabia, did, did you help oh. develop any of those instruments? I mean, they, Oh my goodness. I wish I'd be a billionaire right now, but no, <laughs> <laughs> this was, um, the Axios stent that is actually a cautery driven, uh, lumen opposing metal stent that you saw on the last slide was created by a doctor named Dr. Bin Moller out in California. And he is just, you know, genius for inventing it. And he's still in practice and just, you know, doing great things. So not by me, I just like to use it and rub it. So, <laughs> all right. So this slide is one of my favorite pictures because it's an amazing teaching tool. Um, it basically shows you the end of the stomach, which is a pylorus. It's obviously cut off here. And this is your duodenal bulb. This is your second portion of your duodenum, your third, and then your fourth. The fourth part of the duodenum ends with the ligament of trites. And then the small intestine becomes a jejunum. But this is just like a cut off picture because so much of what I do with gallstone disease specifically is in, captured in this photo. So this picture I, goes- I, I asked my students, so where does blood have to enter the gut above to cause melana, a black stool? You know, and I, I'm amazed at how many of the students know that it's, it's the ligament of trites. Right. It's Absolutely. almost like it's, it's almost like it's a board question in medical school, you know? It, exactly. <laughs> So this picture is wonderful because it talks about where all the different places that gallstones can cause issues. So gallstone disease, it's interesting, right? Gallstones can be three different colors. They can be yellow pigmented stones, which are based yellow stones, which are uh, cholesterol stones. They can be pigmented stones, which are either brown or black stones. Brown stones tend to form when you have chronic infection in your liver, um, like uh, disease like cholangitis, uh, recurrent pyogenic cholangitis can cause brown stones. Black stones are, are also pigmented stones and those are usually seen in chronic hemolytic states. So those are the three different types of gallstones you can have. I'd say the most common ones are cholesterol stones. And usually when I pop those out of the the, the common bile duct, which I'll talk about, they're usually yellow. So gallstones uh, tend to form in the gallbladder, obviously, because there's a lot of bile stasis here, bile sits here, and the cholesterol can basically precipitate and cause these um, bile acids to form into a bile, a gallstone, essentially. So the most common thing you'll see with gallstones are asymptomatic stones that just sit in the gallbladder and don't ever cause any problems for patients. That's the majority of patients. You don't need to do anything for these. So oftentimes they like to ask on medicine boards and even sometimes GI boards for a very easy question is if you have someone with asymptomatic gallstones that was just found incidentally, what do you do? If they're not having any symptoms, you do nothing. You leave them alone. If the stone gets caught in this duct, which is called a cystic duct, because a cystic, it's meant to be, cystic is a representative name for the gallbladder. The cystic duct is what connects the gallbladder into the common bile duct, which is right here. If it comes in here intermittently, and that's usually you know, triggered by fatty meals is the most common thing described in test questions, that's called biliary colic, which is right here. And that's about 20% of patients with gallstones will have that. So it'll, whenever the gallbladder is contracting to squeeze bile out to help you digest your food because it's a repository for bile. If it gets lodged in here, but falls out, lodged in here and falls out, lodged in here and falls out, that can cause symptoms while it's lodged in there. And that's called biliary colic. 
The next step is if it gets stuck in there. Once it gets stuck, that basically means that bile can no longer exit the gallbladder into the common bile duct. And the gallbladder gets really angry when this happens. And that is when you get acute cholecystitis, because if you have a stone obstructing the bile flow here, the gallbladder is mad. It's like, why are you doing this to me? I'm contracting against basically a clogged drain. It will become dilated. It'll get thickened wall and they'll get super infected because those stones are basically like foreign bodies or nidises of infection. And that's when you get acute cholecystitis. And that is when patient needs to go and have surgery or cool down based on whatever their clinical presentation is. But for the sake of test questions and for your guys level, if a patient has acute cholecystitis, they should be referred for surgery urgently. They usually end up in the emergency room with pain, right upper quadrant pain, fever, and then that typical Murphy sign, which we all learn about in on our test questions. The next, the next step is number four. Now this is a very, very, very unique disease, uh, rare disease, but they love to ask about it in gastroenterology and it's called Maritzi syndrome. Maritzi syndrome is when you have a stone that's stuck in a cystic duct, but it's such a large stone and it's impacted so close to the common bile duct that the cystic duct stone, and it's very important to remember that it's still in the cystic duct, causes enough compression of this common bile duct that it basically causes an obstruction here. So again, when the stone is in the cystic duct, but it's causing so much compression of this common bile duct that the bile duct becomes occluded, that's called Maritzi syndrome. It's extremely rare as you can see by this percentage, but it's just something that's in the photo. So I figured I'd just throw it in there and explain to you guys. I did not know about that. I have it's a question. We, we have an enormous incidence of gallstones here. Uh, mm -hmm. Hispanic, the Hispanic population has a lot of Native American genetics to it. Yes, and Pima so Indian specifically. Pima yeah, Indian, we, yeah. Pimas, is that true? Okay. Yes, the Pima Indians have like so, a 90% rate of gallstone disease. We see, we see a, I mean, I sent a patient off for surgery um, this afternoon, you know, in the ER with gallstones. And we see an enormous number of gallstones, so much so that, you know, we get a little bit probably ca casual about it, I think. You know, almost anything that comes in in a, in a Hispanic woman in the right upper quadrant, you figure is probably at least symptomatic cholelithis, as if not early cholecystitis. And so I asked my residents, all right, a uh, young Hispanic woman comes in with right upper quadrant pain and a fever and she's vomiting and her vomit is green. Does that make you feel better or does that make you feel worse? And they always say, well, that makes me feel worse. I say, well, how does the bile Where's, where does that green, what is that green color? They say bile. I said, where's the bile come from? They say gallbladder. I go, no, it comes from the liver. How does it get from the liver to the intestine? They go, well, uh, common bile duct. I said, and then you mean to the ampulla of water and to the sphincter of Odi? They go, yeah, right. So what does that mean? They say, well, it means that the bile's getting into the gut. So I guess the common bile duct is open. I said, well, in that case, does that make you feel better considering ascending cholangitis? Or does that make you feel worse? They say, well, in that case, it makes me feel better. <laughs> so a little, little, just a little fun question I asked the residents. Absolutely. So. That's really, really great. Um, yeah. So Dr. Fowler brought up a really good point that I forgot to mention, which is when you have these asymptomatic stones, that's called cholelithiasis versus cholecystitis, which is an inf infection of the gallbladder due to obstruction of bile flow. So just to go over anatomy before I continue with number five, Right here, what they're not showing is the liver. The liver is a big triangular organ that sits here. It has eight segments, it's humongous. And sometimes it like crosses the entire belly in some patients if their left lobe is huge, but basically it drains bile. These ducts drain bile from the liver. This is the right, common, uh, right hepatic duct and left hepatic duct. They merge to form the common hepatic duct, which is very short in this drawing. But once the cystic duct joins, that common hepatic duct becomes a common bile duct all the way down to the ampulla of water, which is basically a tight, tight area made tight by a muscle called the sphincter of Odi that then dumps all of the contents of the common bile duct, the bile, hopefully not stones, into the duodenum, the second portion of the duodenum. So number five is when you have a stone that escaped from the gallbladder, fell into the common bile duct and sits in the common, it fell into the common bile duct and sits here in the common bile duct somewhere. And that can cause an obstruction 
or it can just be sitting there and be a non-obstructive stone. But either way, they need to come out because if you have a stone in your common bile duct, you're at risk for an infection, just like you are in the gallbladder if it gets stuck here. The infection is called cholangitis and that can be life-threatening. So that's always an emergency for me because I need to go in and get that. So if you have a stone in here and it's just found incidentally, or it's not really causing an infection, you're fine. You have time to take the stone out. It doesn't need to be in the middle of the night. It can be the next day. It can be the next few days. But if you have a stone in here, which is called cholodocolithiasis, just on its own. So you have cholodocolithiasis, cholecystitis is the infection. Cholodocolithiasis is when you have a stone in the common bile duct and cholangitis is when you have the stone plus infection or obstruction plus infection. When you have the infection, it needs to come out immediately, which I'm going to talk about how I do that. If you have just a stone, it can come out, you know, semi-urgently versus electively based on the patient and the whole situation. So stone impacted in the distal common bile duct causing jaundice, biliary colic type pain and risk of ascending cholangitis or acute biliary pancreatitis. So this duct going right here that gets cut off is the duct to the pancreas. Whenever we talk about one of the causes of pancreatitis is post ERCP pancreatitis, which is a procedure I do to get the stones out of here. And I'm going to talk about that. The reason is because the pancreas duct, which goes across your entire belly within the pancreas and the common bile duct basically come together like two roads forming into a highway and they dump into the small intestine. So if you have a stone sitting here in the common bile duct, it can also cause obstruction of the pancreas duct and cause pancreatitis. And that's called gallstone pancreatitis specifically. So that's another reason to urgently take out a stone. If the patient has ongoing pancreatitis and you see a stone in this area. All right. I would, com I would comment Robbie is that in the part that you're talking about right now, that's, you know, deep in the right upper quadrant. Um, um, we, we've referred over the last year many times to Zachary Cope and the early diagnosis of acute abdomen and running the differential diagnosis of these clinical problems. And uh, it is so critical that, you know, when you mention something like ascending cholangitis, which is a, an, 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 an infection commonly gram negative, which comes from the gut in the bile duct. I mean, this is especially because it typically occurs because of either a stone jammed in there or a stricture of some sort, mm -hmm. then th this is absolutely life-threatening. And these people usually have to have surgery or some kind of procedure to be able to go in and drain that. I, I'm, I, I'd love to hear you comment about a case. Oh, absolutely. I have a whole yeah, slide yeah, yeah. about that. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Okay. Okay. We'll slide about Good. that because it's so important to me as an advanced endoscopist that I spread the word about how serious acute cholangitis is and how important it is to recognize early and save people's lives. Because if it's not recognized early, people can die from it. So um, it's very important. So, so uh, that's so, and and Rabia, uh, the most common cause of gallstones is it genetics? Would you say? It's yes. It's thought to be genetics because uh, alternatively, there's not really it's idiopathic otherwise. So the most common known etiology is genetic predisposition, which they found from twin studies and also like parental studies that people can pass a genetic predisposition to gallstones. Another thing that's kind of interesting that even if you take the gallbladder out, uh, the person's bile can still make stones. Yes. And so, um, you know, uh, if God in her wisdom had not made us to pass stones through the common bile duct, uh, we would probably not have survived as a species, I think, because, you know, a lot of the stones will pass, of course. Yes. So a lot of stones do pass, you know, sometimes I get a consult for, you know, this patient has abnormal LFTs, which is liver enzymes that can measure whether or not your bile is basically backed up and your bilirubin is elevated. And so, um, you know, they might have a, a rise in their bilirubin and then all of a sudden it comes down and their pain resolves. And those people pass their tiny little stones because sometimes that happens on its own, but more often than not, I have to go in and take it out. Um, especially if they're in the hospital and they made it this far. Um, okay, so the last thing I'm going to go over in this picture is an even rarer disease than Maritzi syndrome. It's called Bouveret syndrome. Sometimes you have stones in the gallbladder that are so humongous that they actually erode into the small intestine. Like it fistulizes and forms a tunnel from the gallbladder into the small intestine, the duodenum. <laughs> That's called Bouveret syndrome. And what you'll see is a humongous stone that's really like a little 
golf ball in the small intestine and it can even cause obstruction of the intestine if it's large enough. And that's pretty rare. And it's called Bouveret syndrome. It's just interesting. It's in this photo. So I figured I'd include it. And then number seven is just long standing cholelithiasis, which is stones resulting in gallbladder carcinoma. So very large stones can increase your risk very rarely of uh, gallbladder cancer. And so that's just something to keep in mind. If you ever see someone with a humongous stone in their gallbladder, even if they're asymptomatic, it's something you should talk to your surgeon about and see, does this patient warrant a cholecystectomy or a removal of their, of their gallbladder? Oh, so okay. Just, you said something I didn't under, uh, if, if I'm, by the way, thank you. What, what are the, what's the word called for giving somebody's name to something uh, like Marizzi syndrome? Is that an eponym? Is that the word I think? Yes. Uh, where there's still so many in medicine and the challenges yeah. for so many of the students. And by the way, you're listening, you're talking to about 400 people now. Uh, 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 Rabia, um, is, are you saying there's an association directly between gallstones and, uh, uh, gallbladder cancer? Very rarely. Yes. Long standing cholelithiasis can result in gallbladder carcinoma in less than 0.1% of patients. And it's usually typically very, very large gallstones. Okay. All righty. I'm learning so much. <laughs> Two so eponyms that I never heard of. Yeah. So this slide is my longest slide. I just wanted to go over the anatomy with you guys and go over basically all the different stone diseases that I deal with. So now I'm going to go into how I deal with them. So before we go into that specifically, just like Dr. Fowler mentioned, I want to talk about acute uh, ascending cholangitis. So when I mentioned to you that a stone can fall into this common bile duct and cause an obstruction of bile, just like any foreign body in your body, like a hip replacement or, you know, a metallic valve, they're always a nidus for infection. Um, any implant is, and these stones kind of act in the same way. So the common bile duct is supposed to be sterile as is the entire biliary tree. It's supposed to be sterile, but when bacteria like very rarely backwash from the dirty GI tract into the sterile uh, common bile duct, the flow of bile actually prevents it from becoming ascending. But if you have a stone sitting there that these bacteria can like hop onto and basically acts like a foreign body, it can cause an ascending infection all the way up into the liver. Like I showed you in this picture right here, ascending all the way up into the liver. And that's what ascending cholangitis is. It is caused by obstruction of bile flow, usually by a stone bile stasis, and then a bacterial super infection of the stagnant bile, and you get result in early bacteremia, which is bac bacteria spread in your blood. So there's two different types of uh, physical findings and exam findings that are known to describe ascending cholangitis. One is Charcot's triad and the other is Reynolds pentad, and they love to teach us in medical school. So I figured it was worth going over. So in 70% of patients, um, the full triad is seen in 70% of patients with ascending cholangitis. They'll have fever, they'll have right upper quadrant pain and they'll have jaundice, which is just another way of saying that they have a yellowing of their skin or alternatively that they have elevated bilirubin in their blood, which is a sign that their bile duct is obstructed and not flowing well into their small intestine. So if you have those three things, you should be very, very concerned for ascending cholangitis and you should be paging your gastroenterology provider in the middle of the night, whoever's on call, they cannot get mad at you for calling for these three things ever. And if anyone ever gives you pushback, just be like, Hey, this patient has Charcot's triad, in my opinion, you need to be made aware. Um, Reynolds pentad is when the patient's even sicker. It's when you add hypotension, which is a low blood pressure and mental confusion, which means that they're very, very sick. And it suggests that the patient has gram negative sepsis, which means that the, bac the bacteria is not just in their biliary system anymore. It's spread to their blood. And that's again, life-threatening. So these are things that if left untreated and severe can become such an ascending infection that they can get hepatic abscesses and they can even die. So it's very important that you recognize ascending cholangitis. If you're going to be working in any sort of clinical ward, whether you are a medical student, a PA, a nurse, any of these things, you know, a resident, a fellow, an attending, even, you know, in the ER or on the medicine wards, it's important that you recognize this and you act quickly and call your gastroenterology provider. One thing I want to mention is that stones are more often to cause ascending cholangitis as opposed to strictures. So you can have a stricture here, right? Let's say a patient has a cancer right here and there's a stricture. 
Those cancers, interestingly enough, are so tight in their strictures. They're actually pr protective against ascending cholangitis because they can be so tight. By the time these cancers usually present in patients, the stricture is so tight that it's very hard even for the backwash of bacteria to get up there. So malignant str strictures specifically are kind of protective against ascending cholangitis. It's usually the stones that cause the problems. Hey, Robbie, um, it's, uh, stay on that slide, would you? Can you go back? Oh, sure. Uh, the previous it's important folks to look at what she's shown. <clears throat> Someone with an acute gallbladder infection, cholecystitis can come in with fever and right upper quadrant pain, can be quite sick, vomiting, feeling horrible. But the, the gallbladder and the cystic duct uh, doesn't obstruct the flow of bile down into the gut. So they don't turn uh, yellow, they don't become jaundiced. It is when the common bile duct some, becomes somehow obstructed, whether a stricture or a stone, that then you obstruct the flow of bile in, into the gut from, from the liver. And in that setting, you actually get the, the jaundice. I'm, I'm pointing all this out, uh, and Robbie, I hope you forgive me butting in, but no, I'm pointing okay. all this out because when you see somebody yellow, it's not just the gallbladder. It is someone who's having an obstruction of bile flowing down to the gut. And then the second part, which is Reynolds Pentad, adds on to the fact, folks, and we talked about this uh, in our clinical decision making a, a few weeks ago, that when you add hypotension, which is shock, and mental confusion, which is occurring because the brain is not getting blood supply, this is multi-organ failure. So you see somebody who has got a fever they're hurting in their belly and they're yellow and they're confused and shocky. These people are about to die and, and you got to move because they are in real trouble. That stone uh, is obstructing the flow of bile out. There are gram negative bacteria in there and this patient is in bad shape. I have one, uh, uh, Rob, I'm, Robbie, I'll shut up with this. I have one of my nursing practitioners save the life. She was just trolling the waiting room in the ER one day and was just pulling people back because we were so busy. And had a guy with right upper right quadrant pain. Well, guess what? He was jaundiced. He was febrile. And he was beginning to get confused. She saved that guy's life. Uh, uh, they, they went and did an ARCP on him and took, and took that Absolutely. Pain. It's so important to recognize. There was one thing I want to mention, Dr. Fowler, since you brought it up, I will say this is getting into like the nitty gritty of gastroenterology, but there's always an ongoing battle between a patient coming in for um, fever, right upper quadrant pain and uh, you know, slightly elevated bilirubin, is it their gallbladder or is it a common bile duct ascending cholangitis? Because the imaging may not show a stone, the bile duct may be slightly dilated. There's a lot of equivocal cases and our pretest probability for ascending cholangitis goes up significantly when the total bilirubin is above four. Four is a magical cutoff because even acute cholecystitis can cause an elevation of your bilirubin, but it typically does not go above four because, uh, you know, that is just a result of so much inflammation and localized hepatocyte damage and bile duct inflammation basically, but it doesn't go above four typically with acute cholecystitis. So, you know, we have this battle back and forth, but once it goes above four, I'll usually just take them for an ERCP. But if it's like twos, threes, and they have the imaging findings of acute cholecystitis, we usually get like an MRCP to kind of like, you know, uh, see who's, who's really sh should do their procedure first. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, so just a little treatment summary, just to go into this one more time, because it's so important. Biliary colic, which is when you just have that stone lodging in and out of the cystic duct from the gallbladder, specifically with fatty meals, you should send them for a gallbladder surgery, which is called a cholecystectomy. If you have acute cholecystitis, which is an infection plus an obstruction of the cystic duct, cholecystectomy. If you have cholecystitis, which is just a stone in the common bile duct, but no associated infection, they should have an ERCP with a stone extraction, which I'm going to go into detail about, and then they should have their gallbladder removed like later on down the road, not emergently. But again, the ERCP for these patients, just a typical stone disease is to prevent them from getting ascending cholangitis. So it's not an emergency per se, but it should happen soon um, within a, a day or a few days. And then cholangitis, as we mentioned, is an emergency. Those patients should go for emergency ERCP with stone removal or some type of biliary decompression with the percutaneous drain. Ideally, you want them to have an ERCP, which is the endoscopic method of removing those stones from the 
the common bile duct. You should be giving them early antibiotics to cover gram-negative steps, uh, gram-negative organisms, early goal-directed therapy with IV fluids um, and resuscitation. And then at some point they should have their gallbladder removed because the gallbladder is where all the stones were sitting in the first place. Though that's who gave the common bile duct that gift of the stone. So you got to get rid of that house for stones anyways, and make sure it doesn't happen again. All right. So what is an ERCP? We've talked about it. Hey, uh, hey Robbie, I, yeah. I wish my interns could be seeing this lecture. Oh, um, this, <laughs> I'm happy this, to give it again. <laughs> this is, this is, I'm going to make this mandatory watching for my interns. Oh, that's so nice. Um, okay. So what on earth is an ERCP, right? We keep on talking about it. How do you do it? Right. So I showed you guys the anatomy earlier right, of the esophagus here, the stomach here, and then it goes into the small intestine, which we've seen over and over again. In the small intestine is a little pinhole opening. It's like a few millimeters in size. And that is the uh, sphincter of OD uh, muscle contracting around the ampulla of Botter. So my job is to basically, I try to describe this to my family. I'm like, I am holding a scope and from like several feet away, I'm targeting a pinhole and trying to get my tools into that pinhole and then angle it upwards. So that it goes into the common bile duct and not into the pancreatic duct, because if it goes into the pancreatic duct, they can get pancreatitis. So my goal is to hit that target, which is a few millimeters in size and go up at a really, really acute angle up into the bile duct. Then I use different tools and techniques to drag that stone out of there. I will either inflate a balloon above it and pull it down kind of like, um, just like I said, inflating a balloon above it and pulling it down, or I will take a basket and try to ca capture the stone and crush it and then pull out the fragments. Or if I can't do any of those, I'll put a stent around the stone just so that I can have a way to decompress the bile duct. Or alternatively, I can go in to the bile duct if it's large enough, it's larger than a centimeter and scope the actual duct, a scope within a scope. And I can go and laser and uh, hide, I can use hydraulic lithotripsy to break the stone up in real time. And that's one of my favorite procedures. So here is my duodenoscope. It's a side viewing scope so that I can look at the wall, which is on the side of the duodenum. And then I basically have shot dye into this common bile duct. And you can see the, the, the right hepatic ducts, the left hepatic ducts. It looks like a Medusa head. Here is the common hepatic duct. And then here you actually see the cystic duct take off. The cystic duct always looks like this like coil crazy duct. And then here you can see the gallbladder full of stones, like a gumball machine. So this patient had stone disease and it obviously came from their gallbladder, which is, has humongous stones in it. So I took out the stone from the common bile duct, and then I injected it with contrast to make sure that you could see this is under live x-ray or fluoroscopy, that there's nothing left. There's no filling defect in this common bile duct or common hepatic duct anymore. It's empty, but this huge thing full of stones needs to come out at some point. So that's what an yeah, ERCP that, pa that patient is a sitting duck for another. Uh, yep, exactly. So I was I like mean, telling what, the students. What do, you, what do you have? A dozen stones, one on the size of a thumb in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So my scope is about 13 millimeters. So if you see like that, this is about a 13 millimeter stone as well. All right. So this is again, the ERCP. This is a tool I'm using with my side viewing scope to get into the bile duct. Do you see how tiny that is compared to my fingers? And I have like, you know, normal size hands. So you can see that this is just like a really, really technically challenging procedure, which is why you need to do an extra year of training to master ERCP. And then obviously you continue to train as an attending and learn, you know, your comfort levels because it's a very technically challenging procedure. This is that same uh, um, cholangiogram I just showed you, which is an x-ray of the common bile duct, I'm using a live x-ray machine over the patient called fluoroscopy to basically visualize what's in the common bile duct and my endoscopy screen. So I'm staring at two screens and trying to get information on their common bile duct under x-ray and with live imaging. So this is what it looks like under x-ray in an ERCP. If I put a stent in, this is a separate patient who had a cancer causing a stricture and I stented that stricture open with a metal stent and you can see the waste of the stent is right there. That's another procedure I use. Another thing I use ERCP for is to stent malignant or cancer restrictors. And then here is what that patient looked like after I stented their bile duct. You can see the Niagara Falls of bile coming out of their bile duct. And these uh, are- So this, this would have been a cholangiocarcinoma? Cholangiocarcinoma, yes, exactly. A cancer of the common bile duct um, causing obstruction. And these are really challenging to get in. This patient had a bilirubin of like 30. So normal is like less than one. So when it's 30, you know, they've been obstructed for a very long time. So when you finally get that wire through and you're able to stent through that stricture, that cancer stricture, it's a really nice feeling because you know that they're not going to have to have a drain through their tummy to drain them from above. You can drain them from below. So this so, is the bile uh, rushing into the duodenum. So for the benefit of the students, you mean that tube coming down from the liver, the common bile duct can actually develop cancer itself, the tube? Yes, 
Absolutely. Really anywhere in your body, now that I think about it, can develop cancer, your common bile duct, your gallbladder, your cystic duct, your liver, intrahepatic ducts, um, small intestine, the ampulla of otter, the, the papilla of otter, they can all form cancer really anywhere in your body. Wherever you have a gene mutation, usually a P53 gene, gene mutation, and you have unchecked growth and your tumor suppressor genes are basically knocked out, then you can have cancer really anywhere in your body. So yes, all of the areas that I work in can get cancer too, sadly. And we see a lot of it. Okay. So this is a normal, this is not my cholangiogram and I'm going to tell you why I'm saying that. So this is a normal cholangiogram. So you have your ERCP scope coming down. The person filled the, the common bile duct with contrast. This patient, uh, their cystic duct is not lighting up. Maybe they had surgery. You can see it's cut off right there. Common hepatic duct and the right left hepatic ducts. The reason why I'm saying this isn't mine is because this patient, this doctor injected contrast into the pancreatic duct. And that's, that's dangerous to do because then they can get pancreatitis. So I, I, can count on one hand in my whole career, how many times I've gotten contrast into the pancreatic duct. And that's usually due to an anatomic variation. So it's just important to know, but it's a nice picture though, because you can see the ducts very beautifully in it's human being um, under fluoroscopy. So this is what a normal tree looks like. And you can tell it's normal because the common bile duct isn't dilated. It's smaller than my scope, which is about 13 millimeters. So that's nice. This is what that pinhole looks like that I was talking to you about. And you can see now how challenging this procedure is. So you're basically in the second portion of the duodenum, you find this hole and then it's tricky because if you were to put your tome, your sphincter tome straight in, which is a tool I was showing you, it'll, it'll naturally just want to go into the pancreatic duct. You have to angle it upwards and to the left for it to go up into the bile duct. And so it's a really challenging procedure, but it's a really rewarding procedure. I have never seen this before. This is amazing. Yeah. So after you get into the, the right duct, you know, based on your x-ray that, that, um, the sphincter of Odie I was talking to you about, it's protects dirty bacteria from the gut getting into the sterile, the sterile, um, common bile duct. Right. But if you already have a nidus for infection, a stone in there, you can't often pull those stones through this tight, tight, tight muscle. So part of the procedure is called a sphincterotomy to cut the sphincter. So that's part of a normal ERCP is to cut the sphincter. So not only will you allow bile and other things to flow, but more importantly, you can pull these large stones out without causing a tear or a rip or a perforation. So you just accept the fact that there's gonna be some backwash of a dirty GI contacts into the sterile um, bile duct afterwards, but it's better than getting cholangitis because once you get those stones out, they shouldn't get cholangitis anymore because you're not obstructing the bile flow. So that's- Does, does the sphincterotomy also allow air into the common bile duct? It does. Is that pneumobilia? Is that what uh, you're Yeah, about? you'll see an air cholangiogram or pneumobilia and it's just normal then. It's okay if you see that on imaging after a sphincterotomy. So that's a great question. So this is what it looks like after a sphincterotomy. And then you can use balloons and other things to sweep the duct and sweeping the duct is what gets the things out of it. So, um, this is just another picture of a cholangiogram. You can see the cystic duct here and it's cut off by clips. This patient had a cholecystectomy. You have intrahepatic ducts that look like a Medusa head and here's your ERCP scope. So just another picture of cholangiogram. Here's another cholangiogram. You can see the beautiful common, common bile duct, common hepatic duct, then intrahepatic ducts. And here's another gallbladder that looks like a gumball machine. So this patient should probably have a cholecystectomy as well because that's gonna cause problems. It's so jam packed with stones. Here is a picture of stones in the common bile duct. So when we're using fluoroscopy or the live x-ray, you can see that they're basically called filling defects. Um, you're not visualizing them directly. You're using x-ray. So you can't say, oh, 100,000 million percent, this is a stone. But you know that it's a stone based on the fact that they're beautiful, round, nice, like really well circumscribed things that are filling the common bile duct. And this patient probably has a biliary obstruction based on the number of stones that are in this patient's common bile duct. So those need to be removed. All right. So when I pop the stone out, um, all the nurse and techs love to make jokes. It's like a baby coming out and it is, it's a nice, beautiful cholesterol yellow stone that we're pulling out of the common bile duct. And then you've relieved the patient's obstruction. And it's just like a great feeling when that stone pops out. Okay. So that's pretty much all ERCP. Um, if at, an, if at any point you guys want to have questions about ERCP, we can talk more about it later, but now I'm going to go into some of the other procedures that I do. That stone is so pretty. I almost want to oh, make a I almost want to make a ring, a ring out of it or something. Oh, oh my God. I had a patient with three of the most beautiful, like pearl, pearl like <laughs> stones I've ever seen in my life. And the nurse was like, should we take those out and we can like give them to the patient as jewelry? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So another procedure I do is complex polypectomy. So here you can see 
this tissue looks abnormal. So the colon mucosa, which is what we're looking about, is nice and smooth. When it starts to have this appearance, this is what a polyp looks like. And these need to come out because if they are left alone and allowed to just continue to grow, they will become cancer, especially polyps that look like this. So whenever a patient has a colonoscopy, whether it's a screening colonoscopy to screen for cancer or surveillance because they have a history of polyps or a family history of colon cancer, whatever the reason is to have a colonoscopy. If you see a polyp like this and you are trained in uh, advanced polypectomy, complex polypectomy, you should remove it. So what we do for these is I inject a fluid underneath these. It's called a lifting agent. And then it basically blossoms like a flower. You can see how flat it was here. And now it's like popped up like a flower. And then you basically resect it. And this is what it looked like at the end. A nice, beautiful polypectomy should come out like just cake and you use cautery. Um, like slicing cake, use cautery to basically cut it out as well. So that's why you can see a little bit of char here. And then you have a small little defect and that'll just heal on its own, like a little scab. So this is really nice to do for patients because you are preventing them obviously from getting colon cancer. And in a lot of cases, if you can do a nice polypectomy, you'll prevent them from having to have surgery too, because some polyps can't be taken out and they need surgery for those. But if you can take it out nicely and easily, then they don't have to have surgery. Okay. Something else that I do, bariatric endoscopy is one of my favorite things that I trained in and learned. A lot of this was like self-training too. Um, so patients who are overweight and have a BMI uh, cr criteria that they meet for having weight loss surgery can also have uh, endoscopic procedures that are incisionless and I won't say they're painless because they do often have some discomfort afterwards, but basically what I can do is I can reduce the size of the stomach so that you feel fuller earlier, just like a surgery by doing full thickness bites of the stomach and sewing it down. So here is a, um, sorry, this is in my, in my way. Let me move our pictures, our photos, and I'm going to press play here. And you're gonna see uh, me sewing, basically using my endoscopic suturing device to sew the stomach wall. And I take bites of the wall, they're full thickness bites and I essentially do it in a pattern that is like uh, three bites here, cinch, three bites here, cinch, three bites here, cinch, three bites here, cinch. And then I reduce basically just like a sleeve gastrectomy, which is a surgical procedure to do this. I can do it endoscopically. And it's really nice for patients who might not meet criteria for surgery or who don't want surgery because they're scared because this is no incision in their belly. It's just the endoscopic therapy. And it's really nice because they lose nice weight. <clears throat> And it's something that you can repeat if their weight loss peters off. So it's a really fun thing to do. And I do different varieties of it for different patients. Luminal stenting. So I talked a little bit about stenting in the bile duct, but I can also stent in the colon. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the whole term apple core lesion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you have an apple core lesion on imaging, it's suggestive of a cancer. So here's a colon cancer really low down in the colon in the sigmoid colon. And you can see how this looks like an apple core, right? Right there. So that's what a radiologist call apple core lesion is a sign of cancer because the lumen, which would be all open here, has something kind of biting into it. And what you can do for these when they have an obstruction of their GI tract, wherever it is, um, is stent it with a metal stent. So here's an example of a metal stent I put into someone's colon for colon cancer. And this is what it looks like in the end, because these stents have all these interstices. And once you stent a really tight stricture, the bowel like comes through those interstices, but it's open now and they can pass stool and they're not obstructed anymore because a large bowel obstruction from a colon cancer can be life-threatening because it can cause the, the colon and the small intestine above it to perforate like a balloon that's been overinflated if there's no way for the air and the stool to go. So that's another really rewarding procedure for me. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about my path to get to where I am to do all these awesome procedures. So something that I was very passionate about very early on was global health. Um, I'm just like totally switching topics here, but I have been fortunate enough you know, pre COVID, obviously to travel the world, uh, for my studies, not only as a medical student, but then also as a resident working in different hospitals across the globe to try to learn more about their healthcare systems, because they're so different than the American healthcare system, which, you know, has, has its pluses and minuses. So here's just some, uh, here's a picture from India. I worked in a cancer center in South India for a few months in medical school, and we worked, uh, on breast cancer research there, and we're fortunate enough to publish our research. Um, then I, during residency was able to go to Turkey where I worked in a hepatology clinic and at a private hospital to basically earn my keep taught cardiology. So, uh, I taught an EKG course and a cardiology course to Turkish medical students at a private medical school there, which I have to say was like the fanciest 
medical school and hospital I've ever seen in my life. It had like its own art gallery. Um, it was very nice. So <laughs> they funded my trip as long as I taught them. And then I got to go work in their public hospital to um, help patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C and learn more about their healthcare system there. And then here are just some of the travels that I did while in Turkey. Here is a picture of the Blue Mosque from the Hagia Sophia. Here's Cappadocia and another picture of Cappadocia, which is in Turkey. So the reason why I mention this is because not only am I passionate about global health and not only is it important to me, but it was a great way for me to set myself apart during the application process and show people that, you know, I have this unique aspect to my training that really made me more of an appealing candidate and like something to just talk about during interviews. And I would highly recommend having something like that. It's great if it's something that really interests you, whether it's volunteerism or something along the lines of global health or, you know, music, like someone was just mentioning, uh, Cheyenne was mentioning before we started music, so like something that sets you apart um, because everyone who's in your application pool is going to have good grades, going to have some research and going to be passionate about medicine. So, you know, when everyone has that, unfortunately you do have to have something that sets you apart. For me, that was global health. Um, then moving on to research. So research is really near and dear to my heart. We were talking about this before the presentation started. Uh, being in academic medicine, there's the onus is on you to really do research to basically not only be a candidate for promotion eventually, but also just because if you're in academic medicine, it's kind of par for the course that you are involved in original research in original publications, if you can be uh, in whatever capacity you can. So here's just some examples of some of the research I've done within gastroenterology. It was a great way for me to also see what field of gastroenterology sub 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 specialty I wanted to enter by doing different research projects, not only as a trainee, but now also as an attending, like what interests me. So um, my recommendation for research, which is really important if you're applying, is to have at least one research project if you're applying for medical school. And then if you're applying for residency and fellowship, it's really important that you have some research if you want to go to a competitive program because it's it's almost like mandatory at this point. Um, you'll definitely get interviews even if you don't, but if you have it, they'll definitely recruit you, which is a really nice feeling after going through the medical school process and residency process where there's so many applicants to finally be in a place where you're recruited is really nice. So if you do a lot of research, I guarantee you, if it's like good quality research, you will be recruited and it's the best feeling in the world when a competitive program is like, I want you, as opposed to being like, please take me, please interview me. So I highly recommend getting involved in research and finding a good mentor. Um, another thing that I do, which I absolutely love, is medical media. Uh, I'm a medical contributor for numerous different um, media outlets, both uh, television, print, and uh, radio. So it's really exciting to be able to have that outlet. Um, I love talking to people. I love communicating and I love educating. So for me, this is a really awesome way to do that. Um, and there's a lot of like fake, fake news out there in terms of medicine. So it's a good way to combat that as well, because I really care about spreading, you know, appropriate information, especially with things like COVID and vaccines and stuff like that. It's very important that you spread truth. Uh, as a physician, it's kind of our responsibility. So medical media is a great way to do that. Um, here's a clip about me talking about something that, you know, I probably have no business talking about. It's using a virus to cure bladder cancer. But when you're a medical correspondent, unfortunately, or fortunately, you're asked to speak about things that you might not know about. And that's just par for the course, but it's actually really fun. So um, another thing that's really important to do is committee work. If you are interested in a subspecialty or internal medicine or surgery, whatever <laughs> your interest is, all of the different subspecialties or fields within medicine or surgery, whatever you want to do, they have committees or societies or colleges. And it's very important if you're in academics to get involved with the society work, um, especially if you want to enter a tract where you're eventually promoted. So, you know, for a lot of you guys right now, you're focused on getting into med school, getting into residency, getting into fellowship, getting into PA school, getting into nursing school, whatever you're applying for. But down the road, it's also important to keep in mind if you get involved with these societies early as a trainee, they really want trainees, then it's easier to get, be more involved when you're in attending because you've already put in the time. So it's a good idea. Like if you're, you know, in internal medicine to join the internal medicine society as a trainee, because it's usually free for trainees and get involved in whatever capacity you can. They have a lot of good learning opportunities, a lot of like hands-on sessions if you're entering a procedural field. And so it's really nice to do that. Um, I worked on a 
paper recently for the American College of Gastroenterology uh, focused on one of my passions, which is uh, sustainability. And I founded a sustainability group at my hospital that I actually just won a national award for, which was really cool, um, trying to improve our carbon footprint. So I wrote about that and it was accepted for the American College of Gastroenterology, which was a really nice um, accolade for me to be able to be recognized like that. All right, next. So this is probably... We were just talking about this before uh, the presentation started, but this is probably my Achilles heel. My biggest weakness is social media because I find it to be so challenging to, um, you know, just like, I guess, stay relevant. It's hard. You know, you work so hard. I never build myself as like a social media star or anything, but nowadays, like every doctor has a social media account and it's just challenging. So I'm admitting to you guys that that's like one of my weaknesses. Some, one of my insecurities is social media. So follow me, help me out. Follow me. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Delator. I'm also on Twitter and I have like no followers because I just joined Twitter a few months ago and I still don't know how to use it, which is like really embarrassing. So if you want to help me out and teach me about social media, I will help you out in life. So there'll be our trade. Um, and I also have a website and then this is funny. I did this thing with this guy named Dr. Mike. And he is like a social media, like superstar. He has like millions of followers. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm not worthy. So it was very cool to see what he does and how he's a family medicine doctor, but he's created like an entire career out of social media. And it's like so admirable and incredible. I was just in awe of like what he did. We worked on this thing for South Magazine together. And I was just like, this is so cool. I can't believe you get to do this stuff every day. This is awesome. All right, so I want to now switch uh, a little bit and go into tips and tricks that I have for matching, for getting into med school, what have you, um, because otherwise I'll just talk and talk and talk forever. So I just want to give you some tips that help me and to help you learn from my mistakes. So tip number one, I already talked about this, but I think I need to go into it again. Do something to set yourself apart, whether it's global health, teaching in a different country, traveling music, volunteerism, you need to do something that sets you apart because uh, on your application, that is something that not only can your interviewer talk to you about, but it also will make you memorable. They'll say, oh, right, that was a person who's like a concert violinist, or that's a person who volunteered and started their own organization to help, you know, like women in need or children in need. And for me, as someone who interviews people for like each step of the way in um, medical school, fellowship, internal medicine, what have you, it was really nice to meet people who had like very serious volunteerism, not something like they did for one week, but something they've invested years for. That was really great to see. And I think that really sets people apart. Number two, no matter where you are in your training, it's really important to make time for what matters and to have work-life balance. I know that this is easier said than done. Um, I struggle with this all the time, but it's something that's so important to me. I think that you should never neglect your family and your loved ones, um, whatever your, whatever the makeup of your family is, whether it's close friends or, you know, direct relatives, significant other children for career, because on your retirement bed, on your deathbed, not to be too morbid, I don't think anyone will say, I wish I had taken more shifts or worked more. Most people say, I wish I had spent more time with my family. So in medicine, we are notoriously guilty of not having good work-life balance, but in any capacity that you can, it's important to do so. I still remember one of my closest friends from college was in town in New York when I was in med school and asked me to hang out. And I was like, I have an anatomy quiz in three days. Like who cares about the, I'm not saying who cares, but the anatomy quiz had no consequence on my future, but I really didn't speak to that friend anymore. And so, you know, that was like the one chance I probably would have seen to see my friend again, but you know, find balance, however you do find balance is just important. It's very hard right now when you're in the training stage, but eventually when you find yourself uh, choosing a career field, it's important to keep balance in mind because Family, again, whatever makeup your family is, it's just, they're the most important people in the world. So it's important to give them time. Just a few pictures of my family, some of my friends, and then traveling, which I love to do pre-COVID. All right. Another thing I want to mention is that uh, medicine still has a lot of growing to do. Um, so, you know, it's amazing to me that medical school is um, nearly 50-50 now, male, female. I think that's really wonderful. And if you look at the pictures from the days of yore, uh, like the black and white photos of medical school when they were you know, 99% men, maybe one woman once in a blue moon, like we've come such a far away, but we still have a lot of growing to do. So my field specifically is still 70% male, 30% female in the gastroenterology fellowship. And in advanced endoscopy in 2019, only 12.9% of the people who applied were female. And that's nine people. 
out of 70. So that's really not a lot. Um, I think that number is getting better, but it's just important that we have um, you know, diversity, whether it comes to gender or race, it's important uh, because representation matters. And, um, you know, it's also important that we have representation so that people feel like they can do it. I didn't think I could be an advanced endoscopist until I met a female advanced endoscopist who had a family and basically and captured all the things that I wanted to do with my life and made it seem possible for me. So if I hadn't seen that, I wouldn't have done it. And so I'm really appreciative to that mentor of mine because she changed my life and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, it's just important to know that you can always find a balance. I'm an advanced endoscopist and I have to do, you know, ERCP call, but I still have a family and I'm balancing it all and I'm quite happy with my work-life balance. So it's absolutely possible. So if there's anyone listening out there who's like, you know, I don't want to choose this field because I want to have a family and that might be hard for me. I wouldn't use that as an excuse to not go for your dreams because it's always possible. You can be part-time, you can do whatever you want to do and find balance eventually. It might not be while you're training, but eventually you can, it's possible. Okay. So in terms of mentorship, my tip number three is finding an effective mentor. I cannot tell you how important this is. It's probably one of the most important things you will do as a trainee, like just speaking to Dr. Fowler and how he's interacting with a lot of the students who have put on, you know, this lecture series, like he seems like a really great mentor. If you find a good mentor, stick to them, but you have to prove your worth to them for them to really take you seriously. Do projects with them and execute ask for more projects once you've completed the ones and never bite off more than you can chew because if you keep on being a yes person, a yes man or yes woman, it's a yes, 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 and then never finish those projects. And I'm telling you this because I was guilty of this as a medical student, um, people lose faith in you. And then once you develop a reputation, you know it can be hard to uh, backtrack and be taken seriously by that person again. You might have to find a new mentor. So if you find a good mentor, do not squatter that relationship by just saying yes, yes, yes. It's very, 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 very much so okay to say, I have too much stuff right now. I don't think I can do this project with you, but I would love to work on something with you in like one month, two months, whenever. So just make sure that you meet them halfway and that they're not just like helping, helping, helping you and you're not doing anything for them. It should be like a give and take relationship. As a mentor myself, I'm really invested in people who show me that they care. And the way that they can show me is like working on projects with me or, you know, show like really coming to me for advice and taking my advice seriously, um, you know, because all of our time is precious. So as a mentor, it's important for me to help people and bring them up when I know that they're serious and want my help. And as a mentee, I'm very appreciative for the mentors who've taken me seriously and I've proven my worth to them by like working on projects with them and et cetera. So it's important to find a good mentor. Next, um, no matter what field you choose, just do it for the right reasons. You should pick a field that you genuinely enjoy, not because you think it will look good in paper. I cannot tell you how many friends I have who are really enticed by certain surgical subspecialties, but then halfway through training, they just, you know, realize it wasn't right for them. And they had done it for more of like a reputation reason, not that it was a right fit for them. And then they end up switching. And to be honest, that's really a crucial um, time period in your life when you're a trainee and it's usually your twenties. So you really don't want to waste, you know, three years. It's okay if you switch, you know, but make sure that you really think long and hard. Why am I choosing this field? Is it because it will make me genuinely happy and I enjoy this? Or is it because some external pressure that that shouldn't matter? Um, so it's important. I would say that probably my favorite tip is to get to know yourself along this journey. Earlier in this talk, I was talking to you guys about why I chose GI and how I know I'm a problem solver and how I wouldn't do well with patients with like long-term chronic illnesses that have no cure. I just know myself enough to know that that's not what I like. So what I'm telling you is to just try your hardest to get to know yourself along this journey. Um, you know, when you're going through rotations, like two weeks at a time, one month at a time, you're like wishing your life away. I can't wait till this two weeks is over. I can't wait till this one month is over. I can't wait till this next step is over. You're literally wishing your life away during these like periods. I can't wait till I'm in medical school. When I'm done with medical school, I can't wait till I'm in residency. And when residency is done, I can't wait till I'm in attending. Learn from my experience. Like once you're in attending, there's just as many like blocks and like, you know, battles. So just enjoy the process and get to know yourself along the way and try to find out what do you like? Do you like cognitive problems that you have to think through? Or do you like to work with your hands? Do you like procedures? Or are you a very clumsy person and you should absolutely not be doing procedures? That's okay too. But you just have to get to know yourself to know what is right for you. If you are like the biggest klutz in the world, I wouldn't recommend, you know, aggressively pursuing a procedure based field because that might 
result in you being unhappy if you're not, you know, naturally good at it. I'm not saying you can't become good at it. I'm just saying that you should find something that melds well with your personality and how your brain operates and how your body operates, because, you know, medicine can either be purely cognitive, very physical or a mix of the both. So find something that works for you. Um, are you good at problem solving where their solution may not exist? Um, do you have an engineering background? Do you like it? Are you good at fixing physical problems? Then maybe you should be an advanced endoscopist like me. So, you know, just get to know yourself. Um, make sure you foster relationships at every step. Here's a picture from my wedding. These are all my friends from medical school. Again, all my friends from medical school. And these are a bunch of friends from residency. These are all people that I still communicate with almost like on a you know, weekly basis, not daily now that we all have families and we're busy, but, you know, people that I'll be friends with for our entire lives. Cause we went through it together. Med school is really hard. PA school is hard. Nursing school is hard. When you meet those people and you go through that struggle together, it's just to foster those relationships. It's extremely important. You know, Next- uh, Ravia, that's that, what you're saying is so critical. And, and we've discussed that along the way in the last year at virtual shadowing, which is it really is all about relationship building. This is one of the reasons I enjoy my academic relationship here at the medical school, which is, you know, I'm working with the best friends of my life. I love the folks I work with, you know, and, and, and that's an important part of job satisfaction and feeling secure and so forth. Absolutely. And your colleagues now, like as an attending, you know, those are the people that you spend the majority of your day with. I spend more time with my colleagues than I do with my children on a weekly basis. Is that kind of sad to say out loud? Sure. But I like my colleagues too. And my kids are in school. So it's not like, you know, they're sitting at home without me. So, you know what I mean? Like it's important to like your colleagues and foster those relationships and sort of in that vein, it's important to network. It's important to organically network. Um, You know, I told you I have like a fledgling account on social media, but I get a lot of messages from people who I've never met before who say like, hi, can I be your mentee? And we've never even had a conversation before. And I take the mentor mentee relationship exquisitely seriously. It's very like, if you are my mentee, I'm spending hours with you to like foster our relationship, to make sure that you have what you need to succeed. And I take that very seriously. So again, like these networking relationships should happen organically and they should not be forced because then it doesn't feel right. And that person might not be as invested to help you. It's like in college, when you worked with someone for two days and you asked them for a letter of recommendation, you know, that letter is not going to be as heartfelt as the person you spent weeks, weeks, or months with working on something or on a rotation. It just, things should happen organically if you can. Um, You know, people really remember when you work hard for them. So that's the best thing you can do to foster a relationship as a trainee, especially, or someone who's trying to reach the next level. Like uh, Dr. Fowler, you're saying Reagan worked on this um, entire virtual series with you and like built a website. Like that's amazing. She worked very hard for you and that's not something you're going to forget. So it's just really important to work hard for the people that you are, you know, trying to impress and develop a relationship with. And lastly, maybe not lastly, I don't know if there's more tips than this, but follow through on your promises. If you sign up for a project, finish it. And if you don't finish it, it should be a mutual decision between you and your mentor, not just something that you say, oh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And then all of a sudden the due date is next week. And you're like, I haven't done anything that can be really gutting for a mentor. If they put their faith in you and then you're essentially letting them down. Um, If you volunteer for for an organization, commitments should be you know, I won't say a year is a little excessive, but I, in the ideal world, really commitments should be something, it's a long-term relationship to really look effective on your application. Um, don't say yes, unless you plan on following through on different projects, you should be realistic with yourself, your ability, your availability and your drive. And again, I'm only saying this to you because I was guilty of saying yes to research projects to like working on bench research with people. I hate bench research. I should have never done it, but I wanted to see if I liked it. So I signed up for it. And then I became just like a huge mess. And my bench research mentor hated me afterwards. She was like, she's a mess. Um, This was at Cornell. And I'm not afraid to admit that because I'm, I am where I am today, because that was a learning lesson for me to not squander these relationships. But on the flip side, I learned that I hate bench research, so that's okay. Um, the worst thing you can do is say yes and not follow through, which again, I've been guilty of. So that's why I, I'm giving you this wholehearted advice, like really coming from the heart because I've been there. All right. And lastly, share your experiences in your application. I'm not saying that you should like bear your soul, but if you have overcome some sort of adversity or are facing difficulties and you feel comfortable sharing them and you don't feel like it will hurt your application, you should include it. You know, um, people deal with all sorts of stuff. I myself dealt with 
several family members who are doctors getting sick with COVID. And it was really a difficult and challenging two years for me. Um, my own father, who's a physician, got sick. And so if I was an applicant, that's something that I might have included because, you know, being on the patient side of things is a lot different than being a doctor. And it really is an eye opening experience. So it's important to share what makes you human in your application, no matter what you are. I think people really relate to that. And uh, it also makes you memorable as, as an applicant. So it's just something to, um, to remember. And then just a few words to live by before I finish up. Um, Rumi, who is an amazing, you know, Sufi poet, philosopher said, what you seek is also seeking you. And then the second quote, I actually made up myself. And I know it's so weird to put in a quote by yourself because I'm not like a uh, deceased poet, but um, something I made up a while ago that I actually, words that I live by are, I may never be a household name, but I will be a big name in my household because my priority is my family. And I can definitely try to be a household name. Sure, I'll give it the old college try and I'll try my hardest, but I will absolutely be a big name in my household. I will not be an absentee family member and my kids will know me. So that's just, you know, something that I live by every day and it helps me get through, you know, challenges at work and stuff. I remember that. All right, so I know you guys might have some questions and then just another shout out for me because I'm just desperate. Just follow me on social media. <laughs> And that's hey, it. Uh, hey, Rabia, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one of the students asked, would you mind if they contacted you on Instagram just to check in and say, hey, and absolutely, maybe I get tons of messages from people who have questions about applying, you know, trainees who have like, you know, just want advice or just want to say hi, I would, I would be more than happy. I respond to all of them. That's awfully kind. Thank you. Um, all right, folks, uh, Ani, uh, take it away. Uh, we, have yeah, a there's of, a, we have a lot of there's questions. A lot of questions <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of specific questions related to your procedures too. I wish I kind of interrupted you a little bit earlier, but um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get those out of the way. Yeah. Um, one, uh, one student asked, what makes polyps so complex? So polyps can be tiny little nothings. They look like little pimples. They can be three millimeters, four millimeters that you just like Boop, pick off with a biopsy forceps or like a cold snare, which is just a lasso. And you just like essentially rip it off and it's nothing. Those are routinely removed by general gastroenterologists. When a polyp is larger than I'd say about a centimeter or 15 millimeters and starts to laterally spread and may need to be removed in several pieces, then it becomes a complex polypectomy. Um, within gastroenterology, when we look at polyps, we actually classify them not only on their appearance, um, what type of pit pattern they have, which is like the actual design that you see within the polyp, like mucosa, but also like their contour. So they can be elevated, they can be pedunculated on a stock, they can be areas of depression, and those all tell us signs about whether or not there may be an in an underlying cancer within like a pocket of cancer within them. So when these polyps get very large, they become complex polypectomies to remove because you need to do specialized procedure, like injecting that stuff underneath to elevate it. And that's when a polypectomy becomes an endoscopic mucosal recession or EMR. And that's what we consider to be complex polypectomy. Going off that question, um, someone else asked, does a person that has polyps need to get uh, like more frequent colon colonoscopies? That's or, a very, um... very good question. And, uh, they actually just put out new guidelines in 2020 about it's called your surveillance. Once you have polyps, a uh, screening colonoscopies, if you've never had polyps before, and you're just being screened for colon cancer. And historically that was started at age 50, but now, um, you know, the USPSTF has changed it to age 45 and hopefully insurance companies will follow suit in approving that. So let's just say for argument's sake, we start screening at 45 now, especially in people of African-American descent and, um, people with family history of colon cancer should be even earlier if their family history warrants it. So just a few things, if you have a family history of colon cancer, you need to be screened 10 years below whatever the age of your direct family member was. So for example, if your father had colon cancer at age 40, you start screening at age 30. Otherwise, everyone else gets screened at age 45. With no history of polyps, you start at 45. No family history, you start at 45. And if you have you know, one or two polyps, then you repeat in like seven to 10 years. If you have three to like 
three to 10 polyps, you repeat in like three years. And then if you have more than 10 polyps, the recommendations say less than three years. Um, and so there's like different guidelines on this, but the um, AGA just put out guidelines recently and I can pull them up for you guys, but I'm pretty sure if it's like one to two polyps, it's seven to 10 years. I think it's three to five polyps. It's like three to five years. I think it's five to 10 polyps. It's three years. And then I'm, if memory serves me right, if more than 10 polyps is lesser, but yes, if you have polyps, you need more free and colonoscopies. Awesome. And that is really useful. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, more questions. Uh, I think this is going back to that, uh, the case of the stomach relying, relating to the pus. Can you get sick from all the, the pus? In your GI tract? You... Mm -hmm. Like spilling into your gut? No. No. You'll okay. get sick if that pocket of pus has no um, exit. So again, any abscess in your body, whether it's like a gluteal abscess in your butt or like in your leg or, you know, in your tummy, they need to be drained. Uh, pus is just like a, basically an infected pocket of fluid that needs an outlet. Otherwise it will fester. Sometimes you get tiny abscesses, like in Crohn's disease, for example, they can get little abscesses like from fistulas and stuff. And those are like a centimeter and they're too small to drain. And, you know, sometimes you can give people antibiotics and if the antibiotics can penetrate your pocket of pus in your body, it might shrink on its own. But when they're that size for the peripancreatic lesions and they have and they're infected, you have to drain it. Would an EOS guided gallbladder drainage be appropriate for everyone? Or is it just for patients that can't have surgery uh, done on them? It's not appropriate for everyone because those stents are metal and they're not meant to be indwelling for more than really a month. But when you have patients who are so sick that their life expectancy is on the shorter side, like for a few weeks to months, you can just drain them that way and like leave them alone and let that stent stay in place. But when you leave those metal stents in place, whether it's for, you know, the peripancreatic fluid drainage, or if it's a gallbladder drainage, they can cause pseudoaneurysms or bleeding in the area, or they can also migrate. They can also obstruct themselves because they're like, you know, a centimeter in diameter. So, um, they need to come out at some point. Uh, so you don't do those for routine gallbladder drainage. You only do those in really, really sick patients who are too sick for surgery. Everyone else who requires a cholecystectomy should get a cholecystectomy. That's still the standard of care. Awesome. Uh, another question uh, came up, uh, asked, what are the potential complications that, uh, of ERCPs other than pancreatitis? Uh, I think you mentioned that. So post ERCP pancreatitis is one. Um, another risk is bleeding because where you do that sphincterotomy, that like cut up of the muscle that can bleed. Um, it's actually interesting. The angle at which you cut matters. So I always cut at 11 o'clock for my sphincterotomy or for you guys, it looks like that. Um, 11 o'clock because that is results in less bleeding. If you cut at 12 o'clock, like straight up, like a zipper that has a higher risk of bleeding. You can also have perforation because again, you're cutting the sphincter, but if you cut too far into the duodenum, the mucosa itself, you can cause a perforation. Um, you can perforate the bile duct. Uh, you can have all sorts of complications with, with that. You can also be unsuccessful in your ERCP. I guess while we're on ERCPs, how many times did you have to sort of practice that procedure before you felt comfortable and uh, are confident in doing that? Um, I think it depends on the person, but you should do a full year training. In my opinion, I don't think anyone should really be doing ERCP in 2021 without doing an advanced endoscopy fellowship. I will say that that's not always the case. There are some places in the country who will accept graduating fellows after having done like 15. Um, you know, I, I personally like being an academic physician who's part of a training program who did a training fellowship myself, you know, I'm biased, but I don't think that you can reach um, the appropriate level of skill from just doing a few, because those 15 that you do as a general GI fellow are usually watching, you're not necessarily doing them. So I think that anyone doing it should have an extra year of training and advanced endoscopy, but that's not always the case, but that's kind of a political question. So you're baiting me. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was not me. It was, uh, one of our, uh, audience members who had asked that question. I'm just really, I'm the, I'm just the messenger here. Um, I'll, I'll switch more into sort of, um, non-technical questions. Um, so someone asked, how do you balance all these things in your life, especially, uh, with work and family? Like, 
they asked how your typical day looks like. That's a great question. So I am very fortunate to work at a public hospital, which is very important to me. I work at Bellevue. And again, it's a public hospital, so we serve the underserved, the indigent, the needy. Uh, We have a prison population. We serve undocumented immigrants. Um, I love where I work. The schedule I have at my hospital is set up so that I'm able to balance these things because um, I, as a director of endoscopy, I have some protected academic time, administrative time as well. And so I have time to do that. And then also... um, when I, during my first year as an attending, I was like 85%. So like part-time, uh, which was very important to me because my children were very young at that time. And so I, um, was able to do advanced endoscopy at that time. I was the associate director of endoscopy and I was 85%. So part-time. And that's what I was saying earlier. You shouldn't, never be fearful of a career because, you know, X, Y, and Z told you that it's impossible to like have it all or do it all with that. You can always be, you can be a part-time transplant surgeon. If you want, you don't always have to work full-time. You just have to find the job that is right for you. And again, I think almost every different field in medicine has so many different phenotypes that you can find something like that. It just might take some digging. You might not be in your favorite city in the world. You know, I happen to be, I love New York, so I'm happy, but um, it's just about finding the right fit. Again, working at a public hospital also has like some downsides. Um, You know, I don't have as much support staff as the people next door to me in like the more private-ish hospital do, but it's okay because, you know, things just balance out and I'm happy. So um, you just have to find the job that's right for you. And again, you can always carve out something that's right for you too, because let's say, for example, you're in a job for 10 years and then your life changes. You can always talk to your bosses, your mentors and say, how can I make this work? And hopefully you have supportive people in your life and in your career who are willing to make it work for you and say, how can I carve out a time? We have an attending who works with us. Who's been at Bellevue for like, I want to say 25 years. She doesn't want to retire, but she doesn't want to work full time anymore. So she's going to go down to 60%. And that's amazing for her. She'll work three days a week and be able to spend the other two, like with her daughters who are like home from college. And so that's going to be perfect for her. So as long as you um, have a supportive environment, you can carve out a field that works for you. And that's what I've done. Someone asked, what are the minuses of working at the place that you train? (laughs) <laughs> you guys are going to get me in trouble. Okay. So I'm going to be brutally honest. Cause that's just my personality. One thing I will say moving from fellow to attending is that sometimes you're just treated as a super fellow, even though you're an attending, it can be hard to make that transition when everyone sees you as a trainee. Um, that's probably one of the only downsides is like the respect, you know, because people are like, you know, you were just a trainee a few minutes ago and now all of a sudden, you know, you want to be like the big man or big woman on campus. And so it's just important. I'm a very humble person. I don't need, you know, like a lot of the, I don't need people like bow down to me. Like I am what I am and uh, I have a good working relationship with all my colleagues. So, you know, luckily the respect just came with the job, but there were people in other fields who were like, oh, you were my you were my resident like two years ago or three years ago, and now you're an attending, you know, like it's, that's probably one of the only downsides. There's so many pluses though. I know the system intricately when a new attending comes and is like, oh, how do I get this patient admitted? I'm like, I know all the landline numbers. Like I can call anybody and just get it done in five minutes. And I think that just knowing the system, knowing the patients, um, you know, knowing where I, where to go, like knowing where everything is, it's just like a lot of pluses to staying. It's also like a huge compliment to be invited to stay where you trained It's you know, they know you so well and they still wanted you to be faculty. I think it's a huge honor. Um, but yeah, the only downside in my mind is just sometimes in the beginning, it can be hard to be taken like very seriously as an attending when you were just a trainee, but people at NYU were very kind. So that wasn't too much of an issue for me. That's wonderful to hear. Um, someone asked, uh, so I know you briefly sort of discussed academic versus private, um, in medicine. So someone asked what specialties sort of thrive well in those respective, um, uh, fields. Um, so I would say that almost any field can do well in both, but there's some things like, let's say transplant surgery. If you're a transplant surgeon, I think, and again, I may be speaking out of turn here, but um, 
most transplant surgeons are academic centers because most transplant centers are academic centers. Um, uh, I, you know, like, I, I don't know too many private practice transplant surgeons. I know they exist, but it's not like the most common thing in the world. So there's an example, um, almost any other field you can do private and academics, internal medicine, all the subspecialties you can do private and academics. It just depends on what you want. Um, at what time during your medical school route or that did you decide to go abroad or teach abroad? I went, uh, so in medical school, the only summer you get is between first and second year. At least that's how it was when I was in medical school. And so that's when I went abroad for three months and uh, it was on scholarship from the medical school, which was amazing. Stony Brook has a scholarship to support uh, international global health interests. And so they were able to support me in that. And that's when I got to go to India. And then during residency, I was able to find a program through my residency as well that supported global health interests, um, also on scholarship. So that was really nice to do that. So during different, during different aspects, I use all my elective time during my residency to be able to go to Turkey. Awesome. Um, and uh, someone had asked, you know, someone complimented your resume, said you had a great resume, um, you know, not just right now, but through your journey to medical school and through medical school and through residency. Um, but what was your personal statement like when you applied to medical school and later uh, even residency and uh, fellowship? I think personal statements are usually the ones I've read in my own are one of two things. Either they are your generic. I became interested in medicine X, you know, during this, this is what inspired me. For me, it was my father who's a physician. Then you go into like, you know, what, what interests you now? And then you go into like your research and then you kind of talk about the future. That was mine. It was very bland, but you know, it's one of those essays. It didn't, didn't hurt you and didn't necessarily really, really help you. It was just like neutral. Um, and that's, you know, if you don't have anything else to really write about, that's what you are. I wasn't like the most exciting applicant. Um, I had good grades. I was interested in medicine. This is like for medical school. Um, but I didn't have like some big volunteerism, which is why I'm recommending and imploring you guys to like try to do that so you can like relive out the, you know, dream I had for myself. Um, I wasn't the most appealing candidate. I, I just was like a pre-med major who had good grades and did well in the MCAT. And I didn't have anything that made me so unique. And so my essays kind of were like that too. And then uh, as a result, I didn't get that many interviews for medical school. I, I had a really good MCAT score and I had a 3.7 from Cornell. So I figured, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. But you know, the pool was so competitive and people were, you know, music majors and finance majors and had done all this other stuff that I hadn't done. And I wish I had, I wish I had more mentorship to tell me to do that. Or someone at this stage, to tell me how important it was. I didn't have any research. So when it came down to it, I only got a few interviews and I was very fortunate to get into Stony Brook because being from New York state, I, it was state tuition. So, um, and it's a really wonderful school. So yeah. This last year um, on our admissions committee at Southwestern was exceptionally competitive. Right. You know, we barely got under the 515 MCATs um, and uh, we had nearly 25% more applicants this year. So it was really competitive. A lot yeah. of people say that, you know, the COVID pandemic inspired them to like pursue medicine. And on top of that, medicine is one of the unique fields in that job security is like great. I know that there's like, you know, a shortage of spots for residency and also for medical school in the country. But once you become a physician, um, you know, there's pretty good job security. So, you know, in light of like the economic devastation in this country, I think that's also very appealing for people. I don't think it's a reason to go into medicine, but it's just like icing on the cake. Someone commented um, or complimented you, said you're such an eloquent speaker and I have to concur with them. Uh, they also said, um, I figured you would have speaking ex experience on camera, uh, which is no surprise. That's so nice. Thank you for that yeah. compliment. I really appreciate that. I have to say, I used to be a very nervous public speaker. I was a very shy child um, and a bookworm. And, and uh, something that I like to do to push myself out of my comfort zone is the media stuff so that uh, it's usually live television and you have to think on your feet. So I like to practice 
my public speaking and be able to communicate with people as well as possible. But, you know, it just, it took time. It didn't come natural to me. It just took a lot of practice, not in front of a mirror, but like with real people. <laughs> Ani, why don't we yeah. ask one or, we've taken so much of our time. Why don't we ask one or two more questions and then we'll begin to wrap it up a little bit. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go off the public speaking, but uh, did you have to sort of get used to uh, talking to the general public versus, um, you know, to your colleagues or to your patients. I'm sure it's a little different talking on TV than it is talking in as a physician at the hospital. Sorry, what the question is. Um, How do you get sort of used to um, talking on camera in front of TV and sort of directing your answers towards the general audience uh, on TV? Um, it's very nerve wracking. I'd say the one thing that made me feel really good is I do mostly like local New York City television. So there's a lot of viewers. But um, the first time I was ever on TV, I was really nervous, like sweaty palms, like so nervous. And one of the cameramen walked by and saw, could tell I was nervous. And he said, don't worry, literally nobody's watching this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, that made me feel so much better. And now I'm just like, it's like talking to friends. Um, that's kind of what I tell myself. I'm just talking to my friends and I'm doing something good for the community by educating and spreading non like fake medical news, which is so rampant in our society right now. So it's kind of, for me, I just envision myself talking to one of my friends. Awesome. Um, that's all the questions I have. Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, do you have any questions that you would like to get out? What a wonderful talk. This has just yeah. been terrific. I, this, this has been so heartwarming. You're such a wonderful speaker and you're speaking from your heart. Uh, and an amazing technician. You see, I did want to ask you one question, Rabia. When was the last time in the middle of the night you got called in to tie off varices that were bleeding on an alcoholic who was bleeding to death GI-wise and you, you, you were covered with blood in, in the middle of the night? I mean, you didn't, <laughs> talk, about, you didn't talk, about, so, you didn't talk so, about that part. I know. I'm so good at banding varices. Now I could do it with my eyes closed because our alcoholic population is like the highest in the country. I, I don't know if it's highest in the country, but I have so many cirrhotics on my service at all times. So I, we ban varices just like willy nilly, nothing. Um, I didn't talk too much about that because it's more general GI, but um, when was the last time I did that? Uh, probably like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you know, that's, um, we also work in, in uh, Brandon and I in an enormous um, level one trauma center and uh, indigent care population. And we see a vast number of people drinking themselves to death. And for the students, the 300 folks still listen, um, uh, the, one of the consequences of extreme exceptional alcohol consumption is that over time, your liver turns into a stone, blood won't go through it, and it backs up in alternate ways to get back to the heart, which includes blood vessels surrounding the esophagus, which it just can rupture and bleed like all oh, get out. The patient can just bleed to death. And it is a gory procedure to go in there and do what uh, Rabia was saying, which is ban them, which is put a device around them that uh, stops them from bleeding. Often under very chaotic and hectic situation when the patient literally is in deep shock and bleeding to death. So right. bully for you, <laughs> Rabia. I love those, but I don't usually ban it. I usually make the fellows do it because I want them to learn to scope under high pressure situations. It's good. <laughs> Thinking on your feet, as it were. Rabia, any last words to our students? You want to give them a word of encouragement? To, to, uh, to, you're dealing with um, everything from um, medical assistants to future PAs, future NPs, and future medical students. So uh, give, give them a last word of encouragement. Of course. Um, best of luck to you guys. I'm going to say what I said in the beginning. What you're going through right now is so hard, but if it was easy, everybody would do it. So just like keep your head down and just keep on going. You're going to do great things and you're going to do one of the most honorable things in the world, which is help people get better when they're at their most vulnerable. So just keep at it. You got this. <laughs> uh, there was a, one other little thing I wanted to point out. To, it's a little piece of trivia. I'm sure you watched with interest as Ruth Bader Ginsburg was on her last legs and having to go back in the hospital periodically to have a stent placed into her, into her uh, uh, bile duct 
uh, because of, or a pancreatic duct because of her cancer. And so that, that was right down your alley, I guess. Um, and then you were, I'm sure you were watching that with some interest. Yes, right down the alley, right down the road for me. So, yes. May she rest. She was a wonderful servant of our nation. Well, well, Robbie, thank you so much. You uh, will typically have about 5,000 individuals that will watch these talks. Each of them will have a medical career and go take care of 100,000 patients in their lifetime. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. So, Robbie, tonight you've touched a half a billion lives with your grace and your kindness and your technical skill and your wonderful advice. And so I, I just can't tell you how grateful we are. And so I do hope you're looking at chat to watching. Everybody send a thank you. Uh, thank you, Doc, into chat for her to say thank you so much. Um, all right, folks. Well, on behalf of uh, Dr. Delatour and the whole virtual shadowing team and uh, especially my good buddy, Dr. Morchetti, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we've, what a wonderful evening this was. This will be up on YouTube for you. Ani, do you want to show them the exam information? Uh, yes. Um, Dr. Pilcher, do you have a next slide? I think that should yes, have. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. So, so this is the assessment information. You guys can scan the There should be a link uh, that will go out in the group chat. Um, so you will have until next Tuesday, uh, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, uh, like as usual, and you get to attend. Um, so if you guys have any questions on that, just show us an email or uh, message us on Slack. So we, uh, we thank you all for coming, and uh, we hope you had a great night. We have another exciting talk for you next week. We're going to be here if you keep coming back, but we'd like to hear from you and get some feedback. Have we covered everything you wanted to see or are there other topics that you would like to see? And, you know, do you want us to keep going? Because we'll be here for you. Well, on behalf of the whole virtual shadowing team and Dr. Delatour, we want to say thank you for coming and we wish for you a good evening and a good night. Goodbye.